Lord, we praise you for that truth. Were we to catalog our sins, even this week, we would but scratch the surface. For you know our hearts. You know the motives that underlie all things. You know how tainted we are. And we also know that your spirit at work in your people produces new life with new affections and new desires. We praise you that all who are in Christ are indeed new creatures. Lord, we pray that our affections would be for you, that our obedience would be spirit-wrought and pleasing to you, that our wants would approximate your desires and that the reality of our lives would get close to what we desire. We know we fall short of what we will be one day. We know also that we are not what we were. We are in process. Lord, we thank you that even as we live in this mixed condition in the process of sanctification, greater conformity to your Son, you have finished the work for all time of our forgiveness. By placing your own son on the cross and placing all of our sins upon him. And so we find new mercies every day because you are faithful to your covenant promises. You're faithful to your own integrity, faithful to your own purposes in Christ. He did not die in vain. And your people are your people purchased forever, secured by his blood. We pray now as we open your word that you would do in us what you desire And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Last Sunday, we gathered here together to worship Christ, to revel in His glory, to think about future things, to come to grips with spiritual realities, and we do so again this morning. But Monday... You went to work, or school, or perhaps some other endeavor. We left the scene where we were under God's word corporately, where we spoke truth to one another and sang truth to one another, thought about heaven, contemplated our sin, thought again deeply about the cross. But in between Sundays, we have the Mondays or the mundane, the earthy. Maybe you punch a time clock at a widget factory and you assemble widgets one after the other. They all look the same. A pile of widgets at the end of the day, a bigger pile of widgets at the end of the week. Maybe you're surrounded in your workplace or school place by colleagues and coworkers who don't think about the glory of Christ at all who don't talk about it, who don't sing about it, who don't recognize that the universe is inexorably rushing toward that great day. And so we get distracted. And we need to regather. We need to recalibrate. We need to garner again for ourselves and for each other an eternal perspective, a renewing of mind, Uh, thinking again on spiritual realities, on biblical truth. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. We'll be in a number of texts this morning with one great big application. The letter to Hebrews in its entirety is a warning letter not to slip away, not to slide away, fall away from Christ, from Jesus, who is better than everything. The temptations to turn from Him, to drift from Him, are very real and ever-present, and we all feel them. And the book of Hebrews is a, a letter warning against such a things, and it comes with several sections of very pointed warnings. One of those is in Hebrews 10. And there the injunctions follow one after another, here in verse 23, notice what the author says. Let us hold fast 
the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another, to spur one another on, even irritate one another, unto love and to good deeds. Not forsaking our assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And in this context, the encouragement has a specific application, which is the encouragement to hold on to Christ when the temptations all around are to slide away from Him. But you have to connect verse 25 to verse 26, and you notice there is a little conjunction, the little word for in verse 26 that connects them together. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. And farther down in the passage, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What does it mean to go on sinning after coming to Christ? It doesn't mean instances of sin. He's talking here about a, a life that says, I don't want Jesus anymore. I'm going back to the old things. It was more comfortable, my old way of life. Following Jesus is hard. And so the danger here is the danger of apostasy. And so the injunctions in verses 23 to 25 become much more serious. Are, are these the you got to go to church verses? Well, yes, they are. But they are the you got to go to church verses because apostasy. That's this section. That's the import. And we might ask, well, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is yes, indeed. You are your brother's keeper. We have these encouragements to hold fast our confession of faith and to go on meeting together, don't neglect it, and to stir one another up to love and to stir one another up to good deeds because falling away from Christ is serious. And we have the potential in and of ourselves to do it. And this, of course, is not a denial of God's sovereignty and salvation nor the security of true believers but it is the warning to those who think they're believers not to drift. It's a serious and sobering injunction. And it puts before us the great need we have to be together as believers. This morning's sermon is a, a series of biblical principles related to body life in the church. And it has one great unapologetic application this morning, and that is, you should consider being in a small group. Okay, that, that is the punchline from the end of the sermon thrown forward. And, and what I want to do this morning is just talk about the place of small groups in the life of Grace Bible Church, why, are they, why they are important for us, and why you should consider committing to a small group. And by way of an outline, I just have four points for you this morning. Uh, number one is just the question, why are small groups important at Grace Bible Church? Well, fundamentally, in terms of a biblical principle, we need to be in each other's lives. Christianity and belonging to a local church is not a spectator sport. Uh, it requires active participation. Uh, there's not a, a set of performances going up on up front for a set of consumers down below. No, the local church is composed by God as an organism, uh, an organism of interconnected parts. And, and you're probably very familiar with the metaphor in the New Testament of the church as a body, uh, an organic organism composed of various parts, different parts, different kinds, different shapes, different functions, different purposes, but all joined together in interconnected interdependence. Each one of the parts of a physical body is reliant on the proper working of all the other physical parts of the body. And no one part should say to another part, I have no need of you. We can understand that at a physiological level, 
When you stub your toe, your eye doesn't say, oh, I didn't need that, I didn't need that guy anyway. No, the, the whole body recoils in pain, experiences what's going on with the part. It's a very apt metaphor for life in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church with Christ as the head and various parts joined together in the sovereignty of God, placed at His disposal by His plan for His purposes. We benefit from one another. Listen to Romans 12. Just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. And listen to this. Individually, we are members one of another. See, God's recipe for the local church does not allow for the lone ranger Christian, the unattached Christian, the unassembled body part that has nothing to do with the rest. God's design is as Paul described in 1 Corinthians 12. Listen to this, beginning in verse 12. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all immersed into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as He desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, there are many members and one body. Down in verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 12, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And of course, what springs out of this metaphor are all of the mandates, all of the commands of the New Testament that, that flow out of what does it mean for us to belong to one another? What does it mean that we are members of one another? And of course, there are many commands related to this reality. But you can catalog the ones that, that have the words one another in them. You, you perhaps have seen some of those. I'm just going to read an alphabetized list of those one another commands for us this morning, just to remind us the obligation we have to each other as parts of a body is big, it's serious, it's thorough, it's full. Accept one another, admonish one another, be at peace with one another. By the way, the, the references for all of these are on the notes available on the website if you want these. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Be hospitable toward one another. Be humble toward one another. Be kind to one another. Be of the same mind with one another. Be subject to one another. Bear one another's burdens. Bear with one another. Build up one another. Care for one another. Comfort one another. Comfort one another with the rapture. Confess your sins to one another. Do not challenge one another. Do not complain against one another. Do not envy one another. Do not judge one another. Do not lie to one another. Do not repay one another evil for evil. Do not speak against one another. Do not sue one another. Encourage one another in perseverance. Encourage one another regarding the rapture. Forgive one another. Greet one another. Fellowship with one another. Love one another. Pray for one another, prefer one another, regard one another as more important than yourselves, seek good for one another, serve one another, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, speak truthfully to one another, stimulate one another to love and to good deeds, tolerate one another, wait for one another, wash one another's feet. It's quite a list. 
And many of those things can happen quite easily as we gather together in a large gathering like we do on Sunday mornings. But some of those things require time outside of our corporate gathering, a depth of relationship outside of our corporate gathering, and subsets of us for the depths of those relationships. You see, the size of our church is something of a limitation. You you probably don't know everybody that is here. It's likely you do not see all the same people in the same week. It is not likely that you have continuity and depth of relationship that these one another commands require merely in your time here on Sunday mornings. There is also the potential on Sunday mornings for invisibility. You see, the Lone Ranger Christian can come in and step out. If you're anything like me, you're, you're looking around the room and you're seeing faces, I'm not sure I know that person's name. And then the awkward moment. Hi, dude, guy, <laughs> brother. And, and you're hoping somebody else says, okay, what's your name? And then you can pick it up again. Or you have the conversation, have we met before? Yes, six weeks in a row you've asked me the same question. <laughs> Hey, you look new here. How long have you been at Grace Bible Church? About 14 years. (laughs) Listen, if you're experiencing any of those things, we're all laughing together because we all experience them. It's okay to be awkward and to ask for somebody's name again. Maybe we start wearing name badges. But the reality is in a church this size, it's difficult to know people with the depth of relationship that the New Testament demands of believer-to-believer relationships. Just recognize the limitation of Sunday mornings. It's possible to not be missed in a gathering of this size. You're not here for a couple weeks. Do people know it? Do people know that you're not here? Do people know that you're sick? And for six weeks you haven't been able to be together with God's people. Do you miss people when they're not here? You see, we need to be intentionally committed to one another. For real needs in your life to be known and to be met, you need to be known. You need to know others and be in close enough proximity with them on a regular basis that they know what makes you tick. They know what burdens your soul. They know when things aren't right because they love you and they care about you. We need to be connected well enough to be known. We need to be connected well enough with people in the body of Christ so that when there is a need, there is a group of people who are the first line of defense, a first line of needs meeting, a smaller group of people who are intentionally committed to each other to praying for each other, serving each other, people with history together, people with visibility, proximity, and vulnerability, people that pray well for each other because they know what's going on in each other's lives. Let me tell you just a little bit about the history of small groups at this church and why they have been so important. There was something of, a, of an implosion early in this church's history in a leadership crisis. And small groups were those groups of believers who got together and held on to each other for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the mission of the church, for the sake of the truth of God's word, to survive. Small groups were serious. They were a lifeline. They were something of life rafts for a fledgling group of believers seeking to love each other well in the midst of crisis. And you who were here during that era remember how critical small groups were to the survival of this church. And those of us, like me, who were not here at that time benefit from that very real connection that happened. In fact, all of us are sort of riding the coattails of the body life commitment of those early Grace Bible Church people. Until the year, I think it was 2015, that we moved into the building, is that right? Okay, 2015. Until that point, we were renting space. 
We were renting spaces in other people's buildings, and so we only had the keys to the building for a couple hours a week. That really limited the kind of interaction we can have. We have this space now and people come in midweek and they stay late and they come early and there's lots of wonderful interaction in the kinds of ways that couldn't happen when we were renters. And so small groups were absolutely critical to sustaining the body life in this church. And because it was forced, because it was essential, there was a very high participation rate in small groups. And that very high participation rate in small groups proved the benefit of the environment of small groups to accomplish one another care in the life of the church. And that's something that that the church had to do in one season and ought to do in our season. We've seen the benefits. There is significant body life for the church that happens in smaller spaces with subsets of the church carrying out one another care and growing together in unity of doctrine, unity of purpose, and in maturity in Christ. Here's a second outline point this morning. It is simply the question, what is a small group at Grace Bible Church? What is a small group at Grace Bible Church? At Grace Bible Church, a small group is a vehicle for accomplishing important body life principles, body life involvement in ways that are challenging to accomplish well, regularly, intentionally in other venues. By the way, a small group is not itself a biblical mandate. There's no Bible verse that says a church has to have small groups or it's unfaithful. So if you go to a church and they don't have small groups, don't just automatically say, they're not faithful, they don't know what they're doing. A small group is a vehicle to accomplish biblical mandates. It is not itself the biblical mandate. Does that make sense? Notice when we use the word small group, it's it's up there on the screen this way. It's uh, small s, all one word, no space in between. That's not a typo. If we could put, you know, the little r in a circle, registered trademark afterwards, we would. That's intentional. We're we're describing something we're going after, and and it is not merely what the parts of the word mean. A group that happens to be small. That's not what we mean by small group. Maybe there's a, a better name, better term, but for us, small group, all one word, means something. Uh, and not just a, a tiny grouping of people. Uh, we mean something intentional. Something intentional related to a subset of the people of this church. A small group is not just a a random grouping of people that's smaller than what can gather here. It is a subset of this group that meets together intentionally. Let me give you a description. I don't know if this is a definition, but at least it's a description of a small group at GBC. An intentional regular, located gathering of a subset of the church that extends equipping and care through and to its individual members. I'm going to say that one more time. There's going to be a test at the end of this. No, there's no test. A small group at Grace Bible Church is an intentional, regular, located gathering of a subset of the church that extends equipping and care through its individual members, and to its individual members. First of all, by intentional, I just want to recognize that there is a relationship between doing things organically or naturally and intentionally. Sometimes really good things just happen. Sometimes individuals are really good managers of the big picture and don't get lost in the details and the tyranny of the urgent and all the things just sort of happen in their appropriate balance in the ways that they should over time without even thinking about it. That's not me. And maybe that's not most of us. Most of us probably require some attention to the details of planning and strategizing and scheduling important things so they don't get drowned out in the organic or the happenstance of life. Now, you must know that 
organic, natural, just the, the culture and flavor of a church ought to be one of discipleship and one another care. Whatever we can do to cultivate all of that so that it just happens and feels natural is wonderful. And small groups are a way to be intentional. It's not a replacement for the organic. In fact, these things ought to hold hands really, really well. One of the things I love about this church is all of the unplanned, unorganized relationship building and care that goes on. May it never stop. And small groups provide the benefit of planning for intentional time together around God's word, meeting each other's needs, and praying for each other. We say that a small group here is intentional and regular. By regular, we just mean that we've decided that weekly time together is really helpful. In fact, a midweek spiritual recalibration happens to be helpful. Again, if you're in a, a workplace that doesn't give a rip about Christ and you're meeting together with people who love Christ on Wednesdays, no longer do you have a seven-day spread, but a three-and-a-half-day spread. That's helpful. It's helpful to, to be around spiritual people thinking spiritual things, giving spiritual encouragement to one another in the middle of the week. It is time between Sundays devoted to reorienting our hearts to eternal things and to mutual encouragement with our spiritual family. Small groups here are intentional and regular and thirdly located. They are located. That means they happen in a place. Uh, th this is important for us. There, there was a season where small groups met by Zoom and by FaceTime. I, I grant that they're conceivably, theoretically, could be a time for that. But there is a tremendous benefit to being together, face-to-face, person-to-person. And small groups are intended to facilitate that. There are sometimes severe limitations on being able to be together personally and physically. But where we can, we ought. So this is scheduled, planned, in a place, at a time, and sometimes that, again, just happens. You, you find yourself in the middle of the week with other believers from the church, and it's wonderful. We want to cultivate that as much as possible. But I would suggest that our modern American commuter, urban and suburban culture, in which we find ourselves, can be a severe limitation to organic body life. Listen, people are busy with many things. And, and some lament this and say, well, we just need to fundamentally change American society and culture. We need to do away with clocks and conveniences and automobiles. Maybe there might be some tremendous benefits to that. But if you're the first one to try it, your life's not going to go very well. So what do we do? Listen, cars and conveniences have made our lives so easy that we fill brim to brim our lives with all the kinds of activities that can be done. And we leave no margin. There are no margins for a, a casual conversation between a, a soccer practice and a dinner and an evening meeting and something else that has to happen. Yeah, this is a difficulty we live in. Sometimes there are appropriate places to do an audit of your life and make adjustments. I need to make adjustments to create margins so that I have time for people. So that I have time for my spiritual family. So that I have time for spiritual priorities. There's a time and a place to reorient those things. But I will say that busy people benefit from a schedule where we decide intentionally to carve out space to be together to create a venue for some intentional discipleship and some natural organic discipleship, whatever may happen. But we've planned a time to be together and we've planned a group of people to be together with and we've planned a location to do it. And so this is a located gathering. That is, we get together on purpose. And as I said, it is a subset of Grace Bible Church. So the small groups at Grace Bible Church are not designed to be a gathering of whoever happens to be interested in spiritual things, 
but a subset of this body to accomplish things that this church is trying to accomplish with one another. Now, uh, if you want to start an evangelistic home Bible study, please come talk to me. Uh, Let's strategize about how to reach neighborhoods through something like that. Uh, There are some in our church who have done that and done that well. I would encourage you to do that. But that's not what small group is. Again, small s, all one word, at Grace Bible Church, registered trademark. (laughs) We have something intentional we're trying to go after, which is body life principles for the spiritual maturity of the believers in this church. And then we say that it's a subset because we mean the the small group is not an event or a meeting or a calendar placeholder. The small group is the people. When we talk about the small groups at Grace Bible Church, we're not talking about the Tuesday night thing at so-and-so's house. We're actually talking about the people that intentionally commit to one another that make up that group. That's the small group. And so in one sense, the identity of that group, the commitment of that group, the care in that group ought not be affected when somebody is missing from that group on a given week or sick or on vacation or away for business or whatever else may happen. The idea is that small group is extending care to the members of that small group. And, and we talk about it being an extension of care, and this builds on a principle in Ephesians 4. I want you to turn there for a moment. I hope if you spend any time at Grace Bible Church, Ephesians 4 is familiar territory. And Ephesians 4.11 gives kind of the, the fundamental model for the kind of church we are. Uh, This is an equipping model church. In other words, we believe the church is for Christians. Um, Outside the doors is the world that needs the gospel, so we equip saints here to go out and share the gospel with everything that moves. Uh, We don't see church as the gathering where uh, all the unbelievers must be invited for the thing that's really impressive and the expert that does the evangelism from up front. Uh, No, this is for the equipping of saints. This is what Jesus intended in Ephesians 4.11. We see this. Jesus gave some as pastors and teachers. Why, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Uh, What is a saint? Uh, A believer, a set-apart one, one who is born again by the Holy Spirit, a Christian. That's what a saint is. And so the saints are to gather together in part to be equipped to be sent out. It's part of our philosophy of how we describe the church, to draw in, build up, and send out. Every week, believers are sent out to a world that needs the gospel. And gospel ministry to unbelievers is not the only ministry intended here. If we follow the passage down from Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, pastors and teachers are given by Jesus for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. Notice this, to the building up of the body of Christ. These individual members of the body are joined to the body for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. What does it look like for the body of Christ to be built up? What does it look like to grow up as a church, to be mature as a church? Well, verse 13 tells us, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man. How is that maturity measured? To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, which means the the church is done growing up when it perfectly resembles Jesus. So as long as we're the church on the earth, our work's not done. We're in process, we're growing, we sin against each other. Uh, We don't know everything we should know. We're not as mature as we should be. We need to keep growing. And how does that happen? The equipping of the saints for the building up of the church to that end. Notice this maturity looks like in verse 14, discernment. Not as children tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, craftiness and deceitful scheming. But positively, that's the negative side, having discernment against what's wrong, but then positively, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we, plural, are to grow up in all aspects into Jesus who is the head. And then notice verse 16. This is where the rubber meets the road for all of us. From Jesus, that whole body, and then skip down to the end of the the verse, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. 
what causes the church whose head is Christ, whose equippers are the pastors and teachers, to grow up into the maturity the church ought to have? What causes that? What's the immediate cause? The church itself. The body causes the growth of the body. And the mechanics of that are laid out for us in verse 16. The body being fitted and held together by every joint of the supply according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body. Uh, There are two mechanisms involved in there. Every individual part ought to be working properly. When an individual part is not working properly, it stunts the growth of the whole. And those individual parts need to be joined together. That's what Paul means when he says, by every joint of the supply, the body causes the growth of the body. Uh, That is, proper working individual parts have to come together, and in their coming together, properly working, there is a growth that springs from the vitality of spiritual life that happens in our organic interdependence. We get together, filled with the Spirit, our minds filled with the truth of God's Word, running hard after Christ, keeping short accounts of sin with God and with one another, prayerful, eager for the return of Christ, all the things that makes individual Christian maturity, and then we get together and we spill out on one another. And my friends, the effects of that are greater than the sum of its parts. When a church is functioning properly, a a two-factor individual Christian working well and another two-factor individual Christian working well getting together equals more than two plus two. It equals like seven and three-eighths. Because when I'm encouraged by what the Lord is doing in your life as you are properly tracking with Christ, it makes me want to track with Christ better. The best friends you have are are those you join yourself to who think about heaven all the time, who hate their sin and want to grow, who are sharing the gospel readily with others around them whose lives are marked by prayer. You get around those people and you will grow. And your growth as a result of being around them makes them want to grow more. And it's amplified. And the body causes the growth of the body. That is the recipe for these things. That, that when we say that an extension of, of pastoral care comes through the small groups, what we mean is that Ephesians 4.11, Jesus gave pastors to the church Ephesians 4.12, pastors equip saints to do the work of ministry, and small groups, saints get together in subsets and do ministry with one another. There is an extension of Jesus' care through leadership in the church to individual members of the church to one another. Number three in your outline, so what can you expect at a small group at Grace Bible Church? Number one, the centrality of the Word. The centrality of the Word of God. The Word of God is to rule all that we do. It is sufficient for what we do. It is authoritative for what we do. And so the Word of God has to be at the center of small groups. It means that small groups are are not going to be some willy-nilly thing, some free-for-all, do whatever you want. I I was on an airplane one time traveling back from a a pastor's conference, and, and the plane was full of people who were coming back from the other pastor's conference that had happened in town. And I just listened in to their conversations and they were talking about small groups or whatever they called their, their subsets. And one of the small group leaders who was on staff at the church said, oh yeah, we have a small group. We do ours on Monday nights. It's just great because we get our guys together and we watch Monday night football. And then at halftime, you know, it's so rich and so deep. We just ask each other, so how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? And then we watch the second half. It's awesome. What do you guys do for small groups? And I would just say, if we need to change the word small groups, because that's what somebody means, we, maybe we need to do that. But the word will have central place. Small groups at Grace Bible Church will be governed by the word of God. They also have elder oversight. That is, all the small groups at Grace Bible Church are either led, shepherded by one of the elders at the church, or they are connected to one of the elders at the church. And and the elders have a vested interest in the small groups, not just going rogue, doing whatever they want to do, but staying committed to the philosophy uh, for which they're designed. 
And so the small groups are led by qualified leadership. Uh, that is, uh, if the small group's not led by an elder, the small group is led by a deacon. That is, they've gone through a character evaluation process as a faithful servant in the church. Uh, and and it's, it's not a slow or easy process. Uh, there are requirements for a man even before he enters that process. Uh, our small group leaders um, have to go through the, the men's discipleship programs called Build and the Trust. Uh, those things cultivate individual Christian discipline and then uh, bring the, the men who are leading those groups around the doctrine of the elders and what's important to this church in terms of teaching. And so qualified leadership is, is critical to the small group for us. And then you can also expect in your small group interactive participation interactive participation. In other words, the small groups are designed for you to be there and to participate. It's not wall-to-wall instruction. Uh, It's not designed to be a monologue. You're not designed to to be there as an observer in a small group, but an active participant. A small group also is, is not a Bible study per se. Although many small groups do very serious, deep, even verse-by-verse, book-by-book expositional study of God's Word. In fact, don't be surprised if if your small group leader sounds preachy. (laughs) You can get full-length sermons even when everybody is sitting around on couches and chairs and sipping a latte. That's all right. That's part of having the Word of God central. But, But it's not the only thing that happens. And the small group, remember, is not the Sunday morning gathering. So there are are things we do on Sundays that that we don't do at small groups. Uh, Small group is not designed to be a replacement for Sunday. You can't can't make small group a priority over the corporate gathering on Sundays. And while small groups are a good vehicle to accomplish biblical mandates, again, the small groups are not the mandate themselves. Our corporate gathering on Sundays, however, is there are things the church must do together that we only accomplish by all of us being together for our weekly corporate gathering on Sunday. You know that we're here together and we experience preaching and teaching and corporate singing that has uniqueness to Sunday gatherings. Many of the one another care components also happen well on Sundays, but there are some things exclusive to our corporate gathering. Baptism, for instance, and the Lord's table, and the latter stages of church discipline. In fact, in describing the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, when you come together as a church, and then he gives instruction. See, there are non-negotiable elements of body life that we do when we are all together here on Sundays, and we need those. The small groups exist to facilitate elements of body life that are not so easily accomplished on Sundays in our corporate gathering. What else can you expect at a small group? You can expect regular accountability for your spiritual life. There's something right about the Monday Night Football halftime question, how are you doing? If, if what we mean by a question like that is, how are you doing spiritually? It's important for us to be in each other's lives and, and, and not live with the distance of a, of a mere intellectual gravitation towards truth. But the intersection of truth in a life manifested in relationship. Asking each other how we are doing spiritually is an important part of small group. So you can expect to speak to each other among other things, about regular Christian disciplines. And we'll highlight the disciplines of Bible reading and prayer and evangelism and repentance. Your small group leader may refer to those four areas as core questions. If you've heard that lingo at your small group or, or, or maybe outside of the small group, uh, that simply is a reference to four key areas of fundamental Christian discipline that we think are important that we think are, are really important just to normal Christian living and, and have in the small group a, a manifestation and an opportunity to ask each other about. You may be in a small group and have never heard the phrase core questions, but you can expect that your small group leader is regularly engaging in those areas. And so she, you should expect to be drawn out. 
Sometimes with one of those questions, um, how have you been doing with your Bible reading? Or what are you reading in God's word lately? Or what has God been revealing to you of himself in his word? (laughs) Or what Bible reading plan are you on? Or (laughs) any number of variations of that question. And the point is, you and I should be speaking with others in our small group about how we're doing spiritually. Listen, whatever the question might be that a small group leader may ask, you should probably be thinking, I need to answer with what's going on in my life spiritually. Right? If, if somebody is asking the question, hey, what are you learning in God's word? And the most pressing thing on your heart in that moment is that your aunt just died and you're, you're grieving over it and you're trying to wrestle with the sovereignty of God in this, that's probably what you should answer with. <laughs> Does that make sense? As humans, we don't know the heart. We don't see the heart. We we don't always know the right question to get at what's most pressing for you spiritually. So when your small group leader is asking you, hey, what's going on? What are you reading? What are you praying about? Who are you sharing the gospel with? Um, You can answer with any number of answers to those questions, but don't miss what's most pressing on that how are you doing spiritually question. This regular accountability for spiritual life is so beneficial. To to be asked, are you regularly, intentionally, personally in God's word? It's a great question. I need that question. What are you learning? How is your personal love for God being affected by your time in God's word? How is your life changing under the influence of God's word? How is your mind being renewed? Listen, if I know that my friends are going to ask me to share how God's word has been impacting my life lately, I'm far more likely to cultivate the discipline of reading my Bible. That has been the effect in this church of that question being asked on a regular basis. This is a Bible reading church, culturally speaking. And to think about prayer, what, to, to know the, the people that I'm intentionally connected to, what are you burdened by? How are you praying? What are you praying about? How have you seen God answer prayers? If I know that my friends are praying for me, I'm going to be eager to share the burdens of my heart. If I know my friends will be asking me what I've been praying about, I'm far more likely to cultivate the discipline of prayer in my daily life. I think about evangelism. We ask each other from time to time, to whom have you had opportunity to explain the gospel recently? Or, with whom would you like to be sharing the gospel? Or, who in your life needs Christ? Or, for whom can we be praying? And the small groups can build lists of names of people they're praying for, for gospel witness. I know that when my friends are praying for me, for my evangelistic opportunities, for boldness, for open doors, for praying, and they're praying by name for the people I have opportunity to proclaim to. I am far more likely to step through doors God has already provided and be bold in those opportunities. We get to meddling just a little bit in each other's lives. It can feel intrusive. But if you have experienced the transparency and the vulnerability and the care for souls that happens when this is done well, you just can't go back. To ask, how is your battle with sin going? That might be a tough one to hear the first time you hear it. Wait, people are gonna talk about this? How are you doing putting off things that displease the Lord and replacing them with the things that the the Lord loves? How is biblical repentance going in your life? Are you on short accounts with the Lord? Listen, this is an opportunity to confess sins against one another to each other and then experience the sweetness of reconciliation, to be on short accounts with one another. It's also an opportunity to encourage each other in our strategies for fighting sin. Listen, when someone in my small group says, hey, here's how my fight with sin's been going, been a tough week. Here's what I'm clinging to in God's word. Everybody else is just, ooh, I need that verse too. There is a sharpening that happens in the vulnerability and transparency of it. We learn to help each other with these things. And you hear with a compassionate heart 
and it makes you pray for your brothers and your sisters. We ask each other about fresh reminders of gospel realities for our fight with sin. Reminding each other of the grace of God and the gospel of Christ, that indeed we have an advocate before the Father, Christ the righteous, who is a propitiation of our sins. That is, he satisfies all of God's wrath against our sins. And God, who is faithful and just, when we confess our sins to him, he is eager to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We remind, her, remind each other of these things as we're asking about sin. I know that if my friends are going to ask me how my fight with sin is going, I'm more likely to give serious thought to the battle, <laughs> to remember gospel realities, to rehearse them, to be on short accounts with God and short accounts with my brothers and sisters. And listen, our small groups are to dive into these personal areas together in appropriate ways. Right? That, that, that is, they need to be governed by biblical principles of communication, not gossip, uh, not prurient details. And we actually split up genders, guys and girls, to have these personal conversations and vulnerabilities. But listen, there is so much to be gained from hearing each other on these things. I know that my own Christian life has been strengthened by hearing from others in this church how the Word of God is at work to transform their lives. Iron sharpens iron. My brothers have my back. And we learn and grow together. Historically, those four particular questions, Bible, prayer, evangelism, fight with sin, have had significant impact on the culture and body life in this church. If you've heard people ask you about those four areas just at a, a coffee meeting, that's not out of nowhere. Uh, they, they don't get to claim the copyright. Um, this has just become part of the culture of the church and, and what a benefit it has been. It has produced transparency, vulnerability, prayer, evangelism, and Bible reading. They, they have become the marks of the culture of Grace Bible Church. It means that people are not afraid to ask each other questions about our spiritual lives. It, it instead becomes the norm. So what can you expect? You can expect to engage around these themes at small group. You may not hear all four of those questions on a given night. You may hear uh, those questions not asked in that exact form ever. But you will be drawn out in various areas of your spiritual life week to week. You will very likely encounter a variety of customized approaches to helping each other grow in Christian disciplines and in maturity. That's the great thing about a small group. It's not mechanical. It's not road, it's, it's flexible based on the people that are there. You care for one another, not from a script, but you seek methodically, intentionally to give one, good one another care in close relationships as a subset of the church. What else can you expect at small groups? One another care, that whole list of, of one another's that I read. You can expect fellowship, informal, in the gaps, spiritual conversation, um, the small group that I'm a part of uh, starts officially at 6.30 and it starts unofficially at 7.03. There's just a lot of time to gather and the depth of conversation that happens in those unplanned informal margins is wonderful. I, I've been in small groups that uh, ended at 8.45 because little kids have bedtime. I've been in small groups that ended at 8.45 and people left at 12.05 a.m. What can you expect in a small group? Variety. No two are the same. There's a variety of formats. Some small groups do sermon review. They'll take a Sunday sermon and focus on practical application to living midweek. Uh, some small groups you'll be in uh, will do consecutive exposition, verse by verse by verse, through book after book after book um, as part of their regular programming. Uh, some have used good books as discussion starters. In some way or another, the Word of God is the authoritative center of small group time, but the way that works itself out is a variety, small group to small group. You will also experience a variety in schedules. Um, everyone together roughly every week. A few small groups are populated by empty nesters and singles and parents without childcare needs or parents who can provide childcare for themselves on a weekly basis. So they meet all together every week. There are other groups um, that 
provide, or there historically have been some that have provided childcare, and they meet everybody together every week, and they rotate through who's taking care of the kiddos. But most of the groups have set up some sort of rotation so that moms and dads can care for their kids without paying for a babysitter four or five times a month. Men meet one week, women meet the next, then men and women together, then whole families with their kids for meal and a fellowship together. So you'll see a variety of schedules. A variety of locations, probably not enough variety yet. Nine small groups in Tempe, Chandler, and Gilbert. Um, there are small groups that meet on the campus of this church as well. And then a variety of participants. You might have a, a small group that is heavily one demographic. Empty nesters or young families or, or singles. But most of them have some sort of mix. Let me give you one last expectation for small groups. You can expect to experience pain. I thought you were selling us on small groups. Here's what I mean. Uh, Of course, uh, there's one element of pain in a small group that just means if we're close enough to each other to benefit from all the one another's, it means we're also close enough to each other to offend each other, to sin against each other. Uh, and, and so, and I'm not suggesting go to small group and start sinning against people. I'm just saying it's going to happen. And, and if you're not close enough to experience it, you're not close enough in the body of Christ. And some of us have been burned by relationships and hurt by others, and so I'm done with that. I'm not getting close anymore. That's just unbiblical. Okay, so uh, set your expectation to okay, I'm going to be with sinners. I'm a sinner. It's very likely I could sin against somebody and what I say, what I do, what I think, and I may have to make things right. Um, that's just life in the body of Christ. It's normal. But the pain I mean here is the pain of separation. And when it's time to multiply, we don't split our small groups, by the way. We just multiply them. Okay? Um, but when it's time to multiply small groups, we recognize that, that there's a, a, a part of the valley where people in our church are from and, and, and they don't have a small group where they're at and they're driving 30 minutes one way across traffic or 90 minutes across traffic some days. And we need to create another small group and, and some people have to go. We need to reproduce. Listen, this is good practice for sending missionaries from this church. And, and Tyler, I see you sitting there. For sending a church plant to Gilbert. There's pain in that. For, for sending a team to New Orleans. Listen, I've said this before. We, we don't want to send people away that we'd rather be rid of. If it's worth multiplying a small group or planting a church or sending missionaries where there's no church at all. We want to send the best. And, and in this life, in, in our pilgrimage, in this short time on earth, that brings real pain. Or it ought to if we are actually vitally connected to one another. Listen, if it's, if it's painless to send somebody away, you're not doing church right. If it's painless to plant a church, you're, you're not church planting with the right people. If you're gonna multiply your small group and you think, I'm just gonna get rid of the people I don't really like being around. You haven't been doing small group right. So there's, there's pain in this. Listen, if discipleship is happening in the small group, then a small group leader is likely training a future small group leader who may one day leave the group and start another. I'm looking around the room and I'm looking into the eyes of the people that used to be in my small group. Sad. It's really sad. I miss you. And it's so important that you went and started another small group. And another and another. There are perhaps some who have been in your small group for 14 years who are about to pull up stakes and move to New Orleans to be a part of a church plant. That pain of separation after building deep relationships is good. How do you pick a small group? Well, you can pick on, uh, you can choose based on location or format, season of life, the participants in the group, uh, your friends, uh, or your availability, what day or time works well for your family. This is a free country. You could pick your small group. <laughs> Fourth outline point. Uh, let me just ask and answer the question, what small group needs are there at GBC? Well, we think we need a West Side small group. 
out west of here. We don't, we don't have any small groups west of I-10 currently, although some Tempe small groups sometimes meet, meet in Ahwatukee. But that's about as far as we go. And, and we have people who drive a long way to be a part of the church from the west side of the valley. We need a north side small group. Um, there have been seasons in our church where, he, where we have really needed a Maricopa small group, and, and we may need a Maricopa small group at some point. And, and there's a process for having a new small group. As I said before, the, the process for having qualified leadership in place is not a fast one. You can't microwave it, it's a slow process. It's methodical, it involves training, doctrine, uh, watching a life of character, uh, proven shepherding heart, fitness for the task. What are the other needs? I, I, I know that there is a need for people who cannot be a part of a small group at GBC. And listen, there are good and legitimate reasons to not be a part of a small group at Grace Bible Church. Uh, we need to be creative in how to meet some of the needs, the body life and one another care needs and mandates that some people just can't benefit from if they can't be in a small group. Uh, we've had people in our body who can't drive at night, who have other health concerns, or, or just station and season of life can't participate. I would say that if you've scheduled your life to be too busy for intentional body life, that doesn't cut it. That, that's not a good reason. It might be a good time to zoom out, to do an audit of your life and your schedule, to consider the stewardship of your time, your resources, and your supernaturally, sovereignly placed gifts that the Holy Spirit dispenses in the lives of believers? How are those being used? How ought they be used? We have a, at the information table in the lobby today, there are extra sheets that give the current small groups where they meet, when they meet, um, who's leading them, what they cover, do they provide childcare. If you're not in a small group, pick up one of those sheets. Um, visit a few of them, visit all of them, find one, land in one, commit to it. That's my encouragement this morning. What are the needs of the small groups? Well, we believe that you need a small group and we also believe the small group needs you. Placed by God, gifted by God with a stewardship of opportunity, resources, relationships for the building up of the body of Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the reminder of your grace in the life of this church, what you've done historically that has so significantly shaped it. Uh, you have grown us in significant ways, and, and one of those is the, the vehicle of intentional gathering in subsets called small groups here. Thank you for that. I thank you for the effects of it in my own life, my family's life. God, we pray that you would take the principles from your word from this morning and drive them deeply in us. May they be convictions and may they have real life application, uh, whether in a small group or, or in some uh, equivalent that helps us accomplish the things that you put before us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.